want to extend a, a thanks to Steve Kankis and Tim Lance. Uh, where are you guys? For the great executive leadership that you're providing this organization. Um, obviously, it's a big draw, so you're doing something right. So thank you very, very much. I also want to note that, that no great event can happen without the people who make it great. Um, so to dining services, security, facilities, the Marist IT staff, and the many students, and I, I think we have 60 to 80 students that volunteered for this to, to serve during this event, um, thank you very much for working with us over the last couple of months to make this a great success. So thank you. And I'm not sure where the band went. They're, they're back there. Um, this is a very special group of musicians. They call themselves Tenure Track. And each, yes, and each of them is deeply involved in higher education. In fact, the bass player is our own Assistant Vice President for Human Resources, Mike Silvestro. So, <laughs> congratulations. I also want to commend our executive chef, Anthony Legnami. Anthony is a graduate of the Culinary Institute of America, just up the street, and I think the CIO is here. Right, here. right there. Thank you for coming. <laughs> now, Anthony isn't just a great chef, but he's also very involved in the community and has won numerous awards for his work in the disabled and not-for-profit service communities. He and his team put a lot of work into this, and I also want to thank them, the dining services team, for making this a beautiful event. And I think you're really going to enjoy the hospitality we have for you over the next couple of days. So thanks to them very much. <laughs> and now it is a great pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker. Linda Sanford's career at IBM began in 1975 when she joined the company as an engineer after graduating from St. John's University. Linda actually got her first taste of the world of commerce at an early age, operating a vegetable stand to sell produce from her family's potato farm where she grew up on eastern Long Island. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever dug potatoes before, but it is the worst job in the world. I can attest to that. Throughout her career, Linda has assumed one big job after another and exceeded expectations at every stop. As an executive leadership, she was instrumental in reinventing IBM's flagship mainframe computer into an open system and driving IBM's comeback in storage technology. She's currently leading IBM's company-wide transformational efforts. In this role, she is responsible for all of IBM's internal IT operations, and the IBM CIO reports to Linda. Her accomplishments have been well recognized throughout the business world. She's been named one of the 50 most influential women in business by Fortune magazine, one of the top 10 innovators in the technology industry by Information Week, and one of the 10 most influential women in technology by Working Women's Magazine. Linda is the former chair of the Business Council of New York State and serves on the board of trustees at SUNY, as well as her alma mater, St. John's University. We're pleased she could join us this evening to share a few comments about leadership priorities for today's CIO, and of course, anything else that she cares to mention to us. So please join me in welcoming Linda Sanford. Thank you very much. Well, uh, good evening to everyone, and thank you so very much, Bill. Um, you know, over the past several years, I've had the great opportunity, as Bill mentioned, working with the Business Council for New York State and other economic development efforts here in New York. And I've come to appreciate very much, and even more so through those associations, just what an incredible resource we have here in our state's colleges and universities. An abundance, if you will, of world-class institutions right here in our home state. And I've also been working with many of your colleagues on ideas in order to promote more university and private sector collaborations that can actually foster an innovation economy here in New York. And I really do think we have opportunity at our fingertips by working in a very collaborative way. I'm very passionate about New York, about our education system, and, and I spend a great deal of time 
time I very much enjoy with CIOs, not only here in the state, but all around the world. So I was delighted when Bill invited me to speak at this event, which is a confluence of all of those interactions and relationships for me here. I see you have a terrific agenda plan for the next few days at this wonderful location. I mean, this is just absolutely beautiful. The weather is going to be spectacular. So you get to enjoy this weather while you're overlooking the, uh, the Hudson. And I know you will all walk away with many productive ideas, but also um, you will meet new, new folks if you haven't met folks before, and those relationships will be very, very important. I'm sure those connections will benefit over time. Now, as Bill mentioned, I have overall responsibility for IBM's internal IT operations, which is a challenging job for a company like IBM where I have a lot of technologists. In fact, 425,000 IT people. <laughs> and at times, it seems like, you know, we have 425,000 CIOs in IBM. <laughs> Um, you know, IBMers are so passionate about technology and they aren't shy about letting their opinions be known. So we have a very discerning group of employees that we have to satisfy, delight, in fact, enable. We, they have aggressive metrics and budget targets that have to be met, like you, I'm sure, and a large, complex global business to run. So. I spend a great deal of time with our CIO, Jeanette Horan, and our team, our IT team, helping to shape and implement our IT strategy. And I, as I said, I also have the opportunity to meet with CIOs from IBM clients in various industries all around the world. And I, I thought this evening what I'd, what I'd like to do is to share with you some of what I've been hearing these last few weeks and months from CIOs, and also touch on what I think are a few essential leadership qualities that I think will actually distinguish the emerging generation of transformation leaders in the CIO profession. So if we could move to the next chart, please. You know, a couple of months ago, the Institute for Business Value released the latest, and it was the largest ever CIO study. And it reflects the views and the thoughts of more than 3,000 CIOs from 18 industries and from 81 different countries. The study produced some very fascinating insights about the increasingly strategic role that CIOs are playing as leaders in their companies and in their institutions and as drivers of innovation, as drivers of innovation. You know, it used to be that the CIO kept the lights on, right? No more, that's assumed. Now the role, ever increasingly, and it's validated by the study results, is around driving transformation and innovation in your institutions. In fact, the 2011 CIO study showed a clear convergence of perspectives between CIOs and their CEOs, or heads of institutions. And when you compare the 2011 CIO study with IBM's 2010 CEO study, there are striking similarities. Both CIOs and CEOs are focused on building data-driven insight, data-driven insight and intelligence, turning that data, if you will, into analysis, analytics, and insight, and on getting closest to their customers, another shared similarity, wanting to get closer and closer to those customers, and on developing their organization skills. That was the first time we had started to see the convergence of priorities between the CIO and the head of an organization. So what does all of this mean? It means that you are at the axis point in moving your institutions to the future, and in transforming your universities to compete and lead in this 21st century. Next chart, please. So if the role of the CIO is changing, which I believe it is, it is largely because the role of technology in the enterprise is changing. You know, a decade ago, we saw a new technology model emerging. We didn't have, at that time, a very clear way to describe it back then but we knew what it wasn't. So we just called 
We called it the post-PC model of computing, the post-PC model of computing. But we knew that that new model had certain characteristics. It was, of course, networked, that in, it would leverage all of the distributed intelligence that was being embedded into everything, and that it would be designed for the era of big data, big data. Then a few years ago, as more and more businesses evolved their IT infrastructures and began deploying some of the new kinds of solutions, the pattern began to take clearer shape for us. And this is why in 2008, at a most unlikely time in the depths of the world's financial crisis, IBM launched our Smarter Planet conversations with the world. And you've all seen those, I hope. Now, despite all the fear and the confusion that was swirling around at that moment, we believed it was important to keep an eye on the long-term view and to describe why IT will be of increasing value in the new era that is now emerging in front of us. The belief was based on some major shifts that we actually saw happening that are really shaping, in fact, reshaping our industry and the global economy and making the world smarter. First of all, our world is becoming instrumented, instrumented. Today, there are a billion transistors per human, a billion transistors per human, and each one of them cost one ten millionth of a penny. One ten millionth of a penny. Second, our world is becoming interconnected. And very soon, there will be two billion people on the internet. But that's just the beginning. In an instrumented world, it's not just people who are connected to the internet, but it's systems and objects that can now speak, if you will, to one another. It is what some call the Internet of Things, a trillion connected and instrumented objects, cars, appliances, cameras, roadways, pipelines, even pharmaceuticals and livestock. And of course, university labs, libraries, you name it. Think about the amount of information that is produced by all of this interaction. It is unprecedented. In the next decade, our analyst estimates that IP traffic will total more than three and a half zettabytes. Three and a half zettabytes. And of course, you know, that's a one followed by 21 zeros. So it will be instrumented. It will be interconnected. And third, all things are becoming, therefore, more intelligent, smarter. New computing models can handle the proliferation of end-user devices and sensors and connect them with powerful back-end systems. We are moving beyond the petaflop barrier to start tackling exaflop computers. Put that power together with advanced analytics, and you start turning mountains of data into intelligence. That can help us in our day-to-day -day decision making. With so much technology and the networking abundantly available, and all at such a relatively low cost, we have the opportunity. You might even say we have the responsibility to make these globally integrated systems smarter. For more than two years now, we have been sharing examples with the world of smarter cities, smarter traffic management, smarter energy, smarter supply chains, smarter universities, and more. Many CIOs are driving this kind of meaningful change in their organizations, making those organizations smarter, transforming them. And as we move into this era of the globally integrated and intelligent economy, the question for us is, what kind of leaders will be taking charge in this new world? Who will be building these smarter cities, smarter companies, smarter universities? I know from my own experience leading major transformation efforts in IBM that it takes a new style of leadership to be successful in that smarter world. And this is true certainly at IBM, and I see the same thing happening at many of our clients, in particular 
in the CIO profession. For the next few minutes, I thought I would touch very quickly on five attributes that I believe do distinguish the emerging leaders in the CIO discipline, in that profession. <clears throat> next chart, please. First of all, you know, today's best CIOs act as a force for innovation in their organizations. You know, one job of a transformative leader is to inspire people, to capture their imagination, not just turning the crank to drive out more costs or keep the lights on, which we all have to do, but also to identify and incubate new technologies and new ways of doing things that will actually fuel and enable innovation across an organization. I certainly consider this as a key dimension of the job description for IBM CIO. And in fact, we have a special group within the CIO organization that is focused exclusively on developing and deploying new innovative technologies. One area where we've been moving rapidly over the past couple of years is implementing cloud technology. We have found the business case for cloud very compelling and we continue to migrate more and more work to our cloud environment. For example, we've built the world's largest private cloud for analytics, which provide our IBM sales teams and our developers with analytics on more than a petabyte of data on our clients worldwide. So we've taken a petabyte, about 100 different data marts, and we've put them up on this single cloud. And we're also using cloud for development and testing of our new products and offerings to give our developers a self-service computing model. In fact, today, they can now provision server capacity through the cloud in about one hour. That was a process that previously took, at its very best, five days. Now, believe me, me when, when you, you, know, you think about IBMers, they all like their own server, any good developer does, under their desk, that they can just use whenever they need to, right? So getting those developers to let go, right, and to go to the cloud, to be able to call up their image very, very quickly, you know, we knew there was going to be a lot of cultural resistance. And there was in the beginning. But when they saw the benefits of being able to provision it within an hour, release it when they didn't need it, but knew they could always call it back very quickly, they very much let go of the old way and started to embrace the new way. So virtually all of our development and test environments today are up on that cloud. Tremendous, tremendous productivity to be gained from that. We're also piloting a virtual storage cloud, using clouds in our IBM research and elsewhere across the company. And beyond just the cost savings, and there really is a cost pro uh, proposition here, they are significant. The cloud deployments are enabling our employees to be much more productive. Our employees are not creating their own costly environments anymore, which tend to be underutilized, as I'm sure you all know. And to encourage them to move the cloud to the cloud, we're enabling all of these deployments with support and that ultimately translates into faster time to value on their investment. And that's why they have let go of the old and embraced the new. Now, I'm sure many of you are also test driving cloud deployments right now, or at least kicking the tires, if you will. And in today's economy, I think many higher educational institutions are faced with the challenge of taking cost out of their infrastructure. And that's not just a higher educational statement. Everyone is focused on that while at the same time, your institutions, organizations, are looking for you to deliver new, innovative services. We are all expected to do more with less. And I really do believe cloud is a technology that can help us with that. The next chart, please. So let me give you an example, because I, I think this has been a very, very exciting one. North Carolina State, a great example of a university that has invested in cloud computing and is now reaping the benefits, not only for its own institution, but across the state. NC State began with a virtual computing lab 
a cloud computing approach to move their physical computer labs for students and researchers into a shared environment. Initially, it was just for the university and the students and the professors there. But a couple of years ago, NC State opened up that virtual lab to provide students across North Carolina, the whole state, with access to education resources over the internet. So now economically disadvantaged youngsters in Charlotte's urban schools, for example, and underserved kids in rural parts of the state can go online and they can access things like Disney's MathQuest software to build up their math skills. So what NC State has done is not only enabled its own students, but also it's expanded its mission to students in the K through 12 uh, educational environment all across North Carolina. Real innovation, and here it all started with the CIO. So for those of you who are contemplating investing in cloud, I'd, I'd suggest based on our own experience, you start perhaps a bit small and then you grow from there. Find an application that might have you know, the, the, uh, the uh, interest of your colleagues, your business colleagues, your, your uh, school colleagues across the campuses. Begin with a small department or work group, prove the concept out, demonstrate the benefits, and then expand. And we found work within our own IT department, for example, was a good place to start. So we took some of our own internal IT work, put it on the cloud, tested it, proved it to ourselves, and used that as a selling point for the rest of our business. So again, the transformative CIO is constantly pushing the outer edges of the envelope, using technology to accelerate progress for the organization. Next chart, please. Now, in our CIO survey, 83% of those uh, people who took the survey identified business intelligence and analytics as the top priority for their organization. 83%. And over the past two years, analytics has gone from becoming an undefined mandate where CIOs knew they had to act but weren't quite sure where or how to being implemented now very aggressively with a strategic purpose. And these results, again, ring true to me, based on our own internal experience at IBM. We're now using analytics in a whole variety of ways, from helping our sales managers develop more effective coverage plans, to improving the yield and quality of our manufacturing processes, to analyzing potential acquisition targets. Obviously, we see a lot of market opportunity in this space, and we have invested heavily in IBM in building the world's leading analytics consulting practice with about nearly 8,000 experts in this, consult, in, in this practice itself, and also the world's premier non-academic mathematics function. We have about 400 PhD mathematicians and statisticians in our research organizations right now. We have received more than 5,000, um, I'm sorry, 500 analytics applications, um, uh, patents, and in the past five years we acquired 25 companies in order to deepen our capabilities in this space. I really do believe as I look at our transformation um, objectives and vision and, and, and our lofty goals in this space, one of the key technologies to help us achieve that will be analytics, which is why we are investing so heavily in it, not only for our own internal use, but also working with our clients. We have analytics offerings segmented by industry, and higher ed has been an early adopter in many, many cases here. Baruch College, for example, in Manhattan, has deployed predictive analytics to improve their recruiting, selection, and retention processes. And they are seeing a significant drop or a significant decrease in the dropout rate. So I, I have a particular passion for this whole place in space. So I, I got my degree in math and operations research 36 years ago, and I'm finally using it 36 years later. <laughs> And, uh, I, you know, I really do think it will become a differentiator. Again, we are collecting data everywhere, right? Everywhere. What do we do with it? How do we make it, you know, work for us? How do we make, us, make it give us insights that we didn't have before? I think 
I think when I started very early on looking at this space many, many years ago, I, I really hit two major stumbling blocks. The first one, and, and we're learning, we're, we're leveraging those lessons learned as we approach now. The first one was that I, I, I saw many of the general managers pushing back on the use of analytics, saying, oh, my gut, my experience, right? I don't need, I don't need statistics. Well, when I thought about it, the world back then was much simpler, much simpler. You could do the math in your head, right? Today, look at what's happening. Not only is the world so much more complex, it's global, right? But we also, it is changing on us constantly and in unpredictable ways. And so the more you can leverage information, data, turn it into information that gives you better intelligence, the, the, the ahead of the game you will be in terms of your competitors. The second thing they were saying that I learned, I don't like statistics. Like, like, now most people don't. I do, probably many of you do, but a lot of folks don't. And so one of the things we're doing is how do we make it consumable? It can't be, you've got to be able to, and you're, when you're applying it, speak in the language of the business or the department or the organization you're supporting there. So I, I am very, very uh, high on this. I really do think it will be a di differentiator in all industries across the way. Again, this Baruch College um, application is a very unique way, very unique way of doing it. Next chart, please. Now, by far, our most visible effort when it comes to analyzing structured and unstructured data has been Watson. The IBM computer that earlier this year dedicated or actually um, defeated the two all-time champions on Jeopardy. Now, I'm sure many of you had seen the show or read about it or seen it on YouTube or wherever. Well, what IBM scientists did here, starting four years ago, and it only was four years when you think about it, it was a very short period of time. They developed a system that can apply massively parallel processing and advanced analytics to huge data sets. Thousands of algorithms try out millions of possible meanings of different word combinations, and it comes back with an answer in less than three seconds in less than three seconds. Now, I, what I'd like to do is just show you a brief video on Watson that was produced before the show was actually taped to give you a little bit of the history here. If we could now roll the video. There's an enormous amount of science involved when Watson answers a single Jeopardy question. Watson, what is polka? That is correct. There's natural language processing. There's machine learning. There's knowledge representation and reasoning. There's deep analytics. And it all happens in just three seconds. What is South Dakota? That is correct. The computation that Watson's performing is what we call embarrassingly parallel, which means that lots of different threads, different computations, are triggered all at the same time. If you tried to run Watson on a single processor, it would take a couple of hours for each question. At IBM had to create a new computing infrastructure that would allow them to do lots of parallel distributed computing to really bring down the time required to answer a question. So we set about building an optimized system. I use the word system because it's really a combination of hardware and software. That application is the king. Start with that. What are the key requirements for that and how they need to be satisfied? You bring the elements that are required to take care of that application need. We ended up using one of IBM's high-performance computing platforms, one that scales very well, meaning it can run massively parallel computations. And this was the Power7 platform. It has many, many CPUs all densely packed together, sharing memory. Most importantly, and one of the biggest things that separates Power7 is bandwidth. Watson, for example, has to access terabytes and terabytes of data to answer a question. Our processor has 500 gigabytes a second of capability. Most other processors are down below 200. The Power7 system is tuned for very rapid, deep analytics of massively parallel problems. Anytime you have to address a very specific task, you're going to have to bring together both software and hardware to create a highly optimized system from the ground up, from the chips right through the software stack for addressing the needs for that application. We believe that more and more systems will be designed for specific tasks to execute particular kinds of workloads. Watson is that. 
It is obviously tuned for a very particular kind of workload. Call it Jeopardy. Watson wins the game. Very well played, though. Watson is the culmination of a long commitment to speech recognition, large data analytics, supercomputing, all coming together at this point in time. We knew if we could get this to work on a commercial system, the rollout into other fields of deep Q&A would be greatly accelerated. We're going to revolutionize industries at a level which has never been done before. You know, I had the opportunity to, uh, to watch the, uh, at the actual Jeopardy! taping, and uh, it took place at our research labs in, in Yorktown. And I have to tell you, it was just very exciting um, to watch. It actually was a pretty close race in, in the first uh, day of taping, and then it got a little further apart at the end here. Uh, I have to tell you, Alex Trebek, he really is a kick in person as well as on TV here. Uh, he's as smooth and dapper uh, as you see on TV. But you know, for IBM Watson, you know, while this was exciting, and, and we held viewings on campuses all around the United States with college students and, and, uh, and our communities, um, you know, at the end of the day, it was more than just about winning Jeopardy. The real exciting applications are yet to come. Think about it. What kind of technology like this, what could it do? What could it really do when applied to data and the language of fields that are important to your university and to society. We are now working on applications of Watson's technology to healthcare. That's one of the first, you know, a, a doctor's assistant, if you will. Think about it. all this research that's going on in the field of medicines and, and, you know, the history and all the tests done on patients. How do you keep it, keep it in your head, let alone you know, analyze it all in your head. So it's a perfect application. We're developing an application using Watson inside for our sellers. We've got, you know, so hundreds and hundreds, thousands, in fact, of products that we sell. How do they keep all of that in their head? So if we can apply this technology uh, to helping them get their arms around a particular solution, then that's going to be a benefit. So we're looking at banking applications and applications in other industries as well. And in higher education, for example, the University of Rhode Island is working with IBM on a first-of-a-kind project that will actually exploit Watson's content analytics capabilities to help researchers quickly find similar research projects that are happening in labs all around the world and then surface potential op opportunities for collaboration with those research projects. So this is what we mean by building a smarter planet. Next generation CIOs are applying analytics in very creative ways to make their organizations much more intelligent. Next chart, please. You know, when I talk with clients about transformation, one of the topics that invariably comes up is one of governance. Governance. And, and it may sound a little bureaucratic, but you would not believe how animated and how excited business leaders get when I start sharing with them and showing them our governance models. The next chart, please. Now, doesn't that look exciting? <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not going to walk you through this, but I just show it to you to illustrate how in an organization the size of IBM with multiple businesses, multiple geographies, multiple processes, you have to put together a lot of effort into building a governance model that is comprehensive, that actually works to bring the organizations together. I know many of your university systems are just as complex as this. And in fact, all organizations in the 20th century were built in functional silos, vertical silos. But moving forward here, it's all about how do I integrate and enable the collaboration across those silos, those businesses, those schools, those units, in ways that will actually create breakthrough innovation. You want the buy-in and the input of the entire organization, and equally important, you want their accountability. Obviously, it starts at the top, and I've been fortunate to have the strong mandate of our own CEO, Sam Palmisano, behind all of our transformation initiatives. Everybody has to have skin in the game if you're going to implement organization-wide transformation initiatives. So my advice on governance, get 
capable people working on governance. It's not easy. It's not easy. Make sure your representatives serving on your governance councils are in positions of responsibility and they are drawn from across the organization. You have to engage the leaders. These governance models are also not static. You need to take a fresh look at them every year or two, if not more often, to make sure that they are still serving the right purpose. We've changed ours, adjusted ours many times over the course of the last six, seven, eight years. We will often sunset a governance body and replace it with a new one as our priorities change or the initiative is mainstreamed into the fabric of the business. And one other point, these governance models not only help shape the strategy and prioritize your investments, they are where the business value you are delivering from IT actually gets measured. It's in the fabric of the business. So governance, savvy CIOs understand how important this is. And the CIO can very, be, very well be the convener across the organization, the institution, to bring everybody together and facilitate a collaborative approach to solving problems, driving innovation. Next chart, please. You know, Luke Gerstner, who was IBM's CEO way back when we had our comeback from our near-death experience in the early 1990s, he wrote a book about his experience turning around IBM. And Lou wrote in that book, and I quote, before I came to IBM, I probably would have told you that culture was just one among several important elements in any organization's makeup and success, along with vision, strategy, marketing, financials, and the like. But now, I can tell you that culture isn't part of the game. It is the game. And having been responsible for helping to lead IBM's transformation efforts over the past decade, I have come to appreciate this point. If you want to drive real change in an organization, not just incremental improvement, a tweak here and there, but fundamental you know, transformation and change, you need to be very aware of the cultural biases that resist change. It's a natural human reaction. None of us like to change, right? Especially if things are going well. And I'm sure this is as true for you in your universities as it is in IBM. You know, organizational cultures are like national cultures. Most, most of the really important rules aren't written down anywhere. But you must understand the culture intuitively to be an effective change leader. You know, I lived through those early crisis days of the early 1990s, and as difficult as they were, and in some respects, I believe Lou Gerstner had it easier when it came to energizing the organization to change. After all, we were on a burning platform at the time, and everybody understood we had to change if we were going to survive. One of the challenges that faced Sam Palmisano when he assumed the key job nearly a decade ago was how do you continue the pace and the energy of transformation behind all of our efforts at a time when the business is doing pretty okay? How do you keep that energy level going? But we recognize that some major shifts were changing the competitive landscape of our industry. And to capitalize on those shifts, things like globalization, the post-PC era that I spoke about, and, like, and, and the such, we recognize that IBM had to continue to reinvent itself. So how do you kickstart the next wave of transformational change when the business is healthy? Well, Sam took a very unusual step of deciding to begin by re-examining IBM's three basic beliefs, or our values, if you will, which were de decreed by Thomas Watson, our founder, back 100 years ago. And Sam wanted to re-energize and re-engage employees by asking them to articulate IBM's values and aspirations as a company in the 21st century. Tom Watson, you know, for 100 years those values lasted. It was time to rethink them for the 21st century. And so we held a company-wide jam, again, the CIO critical in this. A three-day online, real-time chat session with 400,000 IBMers all around the world. And it was, you know, we asked them 
to weigh in on what should be our guiding values moving forward here. It was a very spirited discussion, I can assure you, and contentious at times. But at the end of the day, IBMers themselves determined a set of core values defined by IBMers for IBMers. That shapes everything we do and every choice we make on behalf of the company today. In many respects, the reexamination of our values lit the fuse on all of our subsequent transformation efforts that have reshaped our company in very dramatic ways over the past decade. And it engaged the workforce in changing the company. Again, if we didn't have the technology to engage those employees in that dialogue and that debate and that discussion, it would be hard to make the kind of change we've been on. Again, the CIO plays a critical role. We talked about the critical role you play because you have the data, and you can analyze that data to help in decision making. Another critical role in connecting people across the institution to collaborate. They have ideas. They know what's working, what's not working. How do you surface them? How do you unleash that and create the collaboration that ultimately, I believe, leads to innovation? If we could change the next chart, please. You know, the more time I spend in transformation, the more I've come to realize the importance of having a disciplined change management process. And in fact, a few years ago, we established actually a change management center of excellence, which is, think of it as an in-house consultancy that works with our executives on key transformation initiatives. And before the group was formed, it was clear that more was going to be required to drive adoption, even with our considerable transformation experience. We identified various reasons. First of all, resources capabilities were pulled prematurely before the actual change was adopted. So you designed it, you developed it, you deployed it, but then you moved on to the next thing before it actually got you know, embedded into the fabric of an organization. Changes were not necessarily plumbed far enough back into the business to make them stick. Required behavior changes were not addressed. It was often assumed that affected stakeholder groups would just get on board, send an email, tell them today student body left. Doesn't work that way. Without more work to help enable them for today's pace of change, communicate, educate, communicate, educate, communicate, educate over and over again. And also too much change was impacting the same population simultaneously, which prevented employees from understanding or adapting to that change. So you've got to think about what's hitting the employee at the same time. So we did an internal study that revealed that projects that actively address change management issues like these have actually doubled the rate of success. So today, when we go in on a transformation project, not only do we look at our process experts and our IT experts, but also change management experts. And all three of those SMEs, subject matter experts, work together to lay out a plan that not only designs and develops a new innovative solution, but ensures the education and communication and ultimate adoption of that new process so that you're actually delivering the outcome you expect from it. And the more cost effective, the most effective, I'm sorry, CIOs that, that I know, the ones who are phenomenal change agents for their organizations, they don't neglect this importance of change management. Next chart, please. Well, I've covered a lot of ground today, so let me touch on one final attribute, if I could, of the emerging stars in your profession, and they are great collaborators. Great collaborators. Think about the way the world actually works today. Very few of our systems are the responsibility of a single entity or a single decision maker anymore. So we need leaders who are adept collaborators, who know how to bring together stakeholders and experts from across business, from across government, academia, different organizations, and more and more this is where the real breakthroughs are emerging. In fact, you know, when we talk about innovation today, we define innovation as the application of inventions, if you will, of new technology. It's how do you, how do you actually apply that invention 
to solving a problem, and it comes from a collaboration of an ecosystem of sometimes unseemingly, you know, uh, groups of individuals and organizations being represented. In fact, the CI CEOs told us in that recent survey that more ideas now come from outside of their organizations than from their own employees. Next chart, please. Well, here you can see how the agenda and the philosophy at IBM Research has evolved over the years. From the 50s through the mid-90s, IBM's research was very isolated. Right? Our researchers worked in small teams or individually with very little contact with others. And it was a lot like the old stereotype that many people still have and still remember about researchers. You know, we're solitary figures in white coats toiling away somewhere in a lab. Right? Well, from the mid-90s through the mid-2000s, we then began to open the doors of IBM research. And there were many more joint projects with IBM's units, our businesses, and with clients and with universities. Today, we've taken it even further. Our researchers have moved out of our labs to do research in cities, in deserts, in rivers, out there with electrical grids and hospitals, working with geneticists and social scientists and cardiologists and neurologists, you name it. This is an era of what we would call radical collaboration. And we've added Smarter Planet now to our research agenda. In the past several years, we have also reshaped our intellectual property policies. And you know, we want to promote and participate in the new development models that are emerging around open standards and open source technology. So it's really been a sea change in our culture since I joined the company back in 1975, when we focused exclusively on protecting IBM's IP and preventing others from using it. Like other organizations, IBM is still in the explosive uh, and explorative, I'm sorry, the explorative stages when it comes to collaborative innovation. We are still learning. We are moving the culture, however, in this direction and will continue to do that. But we have taken great strides and a lot of it because of the new generation of talent that we are now bringing into the company. 75% 75 of our employees have been with the company less than 10 years less than 10 years. They grew up on the internet. They're very comfortable and very familiar with reaching out and working in a collaborative environment. And I'm sure you see this also every day with the students that are coming to your campuses. In our complex world, there is no single organization that has the corner on good ideas. And I'd encourage you to think outside the borders of your campuses. You know, we've had some very marvelous successes with university, private, public sector collaborations here in New York State. Albany Nanotech has created a global hub for innovation in the nanosciences up in the Albany region, creating thousands of new jobs in the process. The New York Energy Regional Innovation Center at Syracuse is another promising example, and there are others. And I really do believe to rejuvenate the New York State economy and to put us on a path for growth and prosperity again, we need to do more of this. Bringing together the top minds from our universities, from businesses, with support from the public sector. And that's how we can create differentiating innovation and growth again in our businesses and our economy. Next chart, please. You know, by the way, if you haven't already, I'd recommend you check out the Center for CIO Leadership. It's a global community of over 2,400 CIOs. You can all join for free at uh, the uh, cioleadershipcenter.com. It's up there. And it's a great resource for keeping up to speed on the latest CIO-related research, thought leadership, education. There are online discussions, and there's networking that occurs. It's a mission. Uh, it's to advance the profession of the CIO and to create the next generation of CIO leaders. And I know that we have many of these types of next generation leaders here in this room tonight. You play an essential role in the progress of your institutions and in creating a stronger, more vital, more innovative New York State economy. 
So I thank you very much for your attention this evening, and thank you for your leadership and for bringing that leadership to New York State higher education. Thank you very much. Any, do we have time for a question or two or a comment, su you know, suggestion? I'm all, all ears. Any thoughts? It's a long day, and you have a long another two days. I know you do. Thank you very much. I appreciate all your time here. Thank you.